So we're back for another episode of Percussion Discussion and uh, absolutely thrilled to have the legendary drummer, Mr. Pick, with us. With us. Thank you for doing this, Pick. It's much appreciated. No problems, Matt. Thank let's you. Thank on. you. <laughs> right, let's get straight in. Where did your uh, passion for drumming all begin? Where did it all start for you? Well, um, my earliest rec recollection is playing biscuit tins with the uh, knitting needles. Mm -hmm. You know, the kind of Christmas Cadbury's roses things. <laughs> I seem to remember that. I remember that. And that seemed to be remain dormant for, for years and years and years. Uh, I grew up in Leicester, of course. And uh, then I distinctly remember seeing a marching band around the streets in my local area. It was a boys brigade band. And in those days, it was much more, it was much easier to spontaneously just walk off following them along the pavement. You know, there was no kind of crisis about where they'd gone, are they in danger, who will abscond and all that sort of thing. And so um, I wanted to join this kind of uh, organization, but they were very cute. You know, you, you, you had to be 11. Mm -hmm. So it was mainly secondary school kind of onwards. And uh, if you had any kind of aspiration to join the band, they had it down really good. You had to march behind for a year. Right, okay. So I wanted to play, oh, you, you can't do it. You've got to march behind for a year. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you march left, right, left, right, behind for a year. And then you do a year and it's right, I want to play drums. Oh, they all want to play the drums. <laughs> You've got to play the bugle for a year. <laughs> <laughs> you got to pay so your I blew my brains out for a year. I can still do a rendition of Last Post <laughs> on a bugle. After that, the year with the bugle, I finally got the drum. And this was intermingled with... Um, pestering my mother who made all executive decisions about the drums um i want a drum kit and i couldn't have one i couldn't have one and i think the main motivation from her end was that she was worried about the noise yeah. and the neighbors and that kind of era the late um late 50s early 60s just, just before the beatles was the shadows really the shadows were king mm -hmm. uh, in those days and i'm really kind of blessed with that because Maybe we'll get onto that a bit later. Um, so I eventually got this drum and I was just off, I was just off flying. Within a year, I was the lead drummer because there's natural wastage of uh, people. You know, you get to 15, 16, you go to 17, you go to university. So you're no longer, you know, local anymore. So yeah. there's a na natural turnover of stuff. Uh, the only thing, I was never really the lead drummer officially because I didn't have any stripes. You know, it was like a sort of mini army kind of organization. Yeah, sure. But it was affiliated to a church. Um, now, as soon as I got that drum and seemed to be, you know, getting along with life, uh, my parents uh, produced a drum kit, which was to my biggest regret, as I don't have it now anymore. Yeah. It was an Ajax Boozy and Hawks red kit. And I thought it was kind of half a kit, but you know, because it had um, a bass drum, snare drum, and a rack tom, but no floor tom tom. But I've been looking at footage of old 1930s drummers just recently, mm -hmm. and that is a kit. They don't, you know, they, they didn't, it, I don't think they, they came with a floor they, tom. They didn't have floor toms, no. that, that was a kit. Symbol and maybe some odd gongs and yeah. skulls. Or so, and my biggest regret is that uh, I just traded that in to, to get an Olympic kit mm. in very short time because, um, I started playing in a band almost mm. not immediately, but you know, pretty, pretty, in pretty quick order. I was in a band and had a paper round. So I traded the, the Ajax for as a deposit and I got this Olympic kit, which did have a floor tom tom, <laughs> but I'd still love to have that Ajax yeah. kit. And, uh, yeah, it was, that was just really the, the start really. I think, I think after that, I just kind of followed, my instincts and followed my nose and uh, ended up where I, where I am, you know, but the, uh, I think the biggest step was uh, I kind of got involved with this band called the Barclay Squares who were probably second to James King and the Freeners in Leicester who became, who, who metamorphosed into family. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They, uh, we were the second group in Leicester. Mm. It basically meant that, uh, you started to play out of town mm. and you, you had a Ford Thames van. 
<laughs> you know, not a Bedford Dormobile, you know, because there's all that one-upmanship going on. Yeah. And we ended up going to Germany, so, you know, doing the, what I call this, the, the mind shifts, you know, we, you play in these clubs, Saturday you'd play probably two o'clock in the afternoon to six o'clock, have an hour off and then play eight o'clock till about two o'clock in the morning. That's full on, isn't it? It's 45 minutes on and 15 minutes off. And uh, I remember we went to Hamburg. We had about uh, 30 songs and we came back three months later. We had um, about 100 <laughs> songs <laughs> of var various nature. We, we, we pilfered off other groups yeah. and we encountered. That's a good song to do. And we did things like I Could Have Danced All Night from <laughs> My Fair Lady. Yeah, yeah, but we did it rock, rock style. And it was... It was great. We did some blues, we did some Beatles, we did some Stones, we did some Howling Wolves stuff, you know. They just, the, the Germans were just dying for Kleiner English and music and, yeah. you know, and... Uh, stuff they could dance. Yeah, it was, it was kind of baptism stuff? of fire for me. Yeah, did they have to be like dancing stuff for them or...? Not really, you just no? had to... We, we, we basically, when we were uh, gigging in, in England, we all had regular jobs, we decided... I didn't make any decisions. I was just the youngest and it was, it was pretty easy for me. We go in here, we go in there, we're having a rehearsal. Yeah, okay, I'll be there. Yeah. It was pretty easy for me, you know, and it, and it was uh, just being the youngest in the band was a doddle because you just followed, you followed the rest of them, you know, and it was yeah. kind of safety net as well. You, I haven't got, I've got loads of time on my side. <laughs> you know, these guys are much older than me. And if, in, in essence, they were about three years older than me, yeah. but it seemed like a huge gulf to me. Yeah. Um, we basically went down to London to do an audition with hundreds of other bands in this dance hall in, uh, I think it was South East London. Um, it was incredible, really. You know, you just, you walked into this dance hall and there was a, a, a table in the middle of the room with three unknown adults there, and, and that which, which they were basically an English agent and two German agents. Mm -hmm. And there's this like a conveyor belt of bands either in the process of moving out, moving in, setting up, testing, playing, taking stuff down. And it was just a, you know, you just, everybody was setting up around the room and the table was moved to face these, you play three songs and you were either accepted or you weren't. And we were accepted and probably three months later with work permits and everything sorted out and visas. This is way before Brexit. Mm -hmm. um, way before the EEC and things, European Economic Community, we just went with work permits or visas, and off you went. We played. Uh, it was a hoot, really. It was. A great, I'm not sure it was a hoot at the time, but <laughs> when you look back on it, you think, "Oh, this is great." You know, I've got lots of stories about that. That uh, I remember, we went to a place in Cologne, and uh, the band moving out, or another English band. They didn't have so far to travel for their next engagement. And they, we asked them, as you do when you're abroad, you meet somebody else, you same language, you swap notes. And they said, oh, on Tuesday nights, um, if it's quiet, this guy comes in, his name's Klaus. And he will say, Spielen Bully Bully. This, um, Sam, Sam Sham and the Pharaohs was a big yeah. hit. It's, it, you know, it's, I was quite a snob in those days. I thought, oh, I don't want to play that. He said, no, but you see, what happens is basically you say, Nicht können, nicht können, Bully Bully. And he says, Spielen Bully Bully. He said, Nicht können Sie, entschuldigen Sie. And then he would say, Fünf Bier, five beers. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. And he said, I said, okay, what happens? He said, well, see if you can beat the record. It was a quiet night. The, uh, we, ha we played it 12 times in cons in, in consecutively. So we got 60 beers. <laughs> and we tried it, but it was uh, we we ended it about four times. And uh, the night he ca Klaus came in for us, the basic there were other people in the room, so yeah. it wasn't. So the guy wasn't selling sixty beers; he was emptying emptying the room because this band only knows one song. <laughs> so, um, but there's loads of stories like that from from that era. Um, it was you know, it was um. I guess really it was a kind of subtle introduction to me because I had by that stage in uh, left school and I had a day job and of course going to Germany necessitated 
quitting the day job. Mm, mm. So um, all of a sudden I was by default, I was a kind of professional musician and we just all looked at each other, but oh, this is better than working. <laughs> 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 so it was good, you know, and it was, uh, it was way before mobile phones and computers and synthesizers. It was, you know, it was, it was a, the kind of nice time as much as if you heard a sound on a record, you knew somebody had had to make that sound. Yeah, of course. So it was kind of uh, what we would call labor intensive. Yeah. But at least you knew you could recreate it as well if somebody's made it. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah, because there wasn't much overdubbing either in those days, you know, it was in the early days. Mm. But um, to just really kind of get around it, I mean, I was hearing stuff like, because in those days, the only thing you could hear really was Radio Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. which would play and the BBC was pretty kind of straight up and down you know yeah. good morning this is the BBC mm -hmm. good morning it's a beautiful day and you know and, and uh, the television used to close down at 11 o'clock uh, so Luxembourg was our your only kind of possible introduction into something that was what might, you might call a bit racier mm -hmm. you know mm. but I remember even so I remember listening to stuff like the Shadows the Everly Brothers and it seems to fit in nicely with uh, most of my contemporaries as 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 um their founding influences you know when you first start and really to if you, if you kind of dissect those kind of records they were well made absolutely you know, there was a rhythm guitar who played rhythm there were, you know like bruce welsh there was a good yeah. drummer in the shadows Brian Bennett, yeah. you know the everly brothers had great great drums you know kathy's mm. clown yeah and the the, the the bell on the cymbal you know he it, it, it was a kind of active participant in creating the the atmosphere and the ambience of the of the record you know so i'm very fortunate in that way you know and then the, the beatles timing really opened up a lot of doors for people to go to germany as i did because it was as i say you know um falling into professional playing without thinking about it really you know yeah. i wasn't i didn't sign a contract i just just went along with this band and it was kind of the kind of um, momentum of the time really yeah. yeah it was good fun it was good fun absolutely so so once you got back i mean wh where did you i know uh, well early to mid 70s you ended up in rockfield didn't you for uh... well prior to that um i uh, i was basically we came back from germany with this band called the barclay squares mm -hmm. and uh, we would be kind of between, I think we, we went a couple of times to Germany. Um, and then the, after the second occasion, we thought, well, we want to stay professionals. So we'll, we'll sign on uh, and try and get some money to, to keep us, bide us over through the, the barren weeks when we don't get so many gigs in England anymore. Yeah. Uh, and the, 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 basically the employment agency, look, we are not a music agency you will have to, if you want to continue to receive dole money, you'll have to make an honest attempt to go for interviews. Mm -hmm. And you, you kind of did what, what authority kind of said in those days. So I went for an interview to this warehouseman and I was so nonchalant and so kind of relaxed about it because I didn't want it. They bloody well gave me the job, <laughs> didn't they? <laughs> so and that was on a Friday. I said, so this is, <laughs> you can start on Monday. Oh shit! That's the end of my dream. Uh, and over the weekend, we um, we played a couple of gigs. And at one of these gigs, this I came off the bandstand at kind of half time, so to speak. This long-haired, blonde guy waggled his finger at me and said he wanted to speak to me. And he said, uh, "Do you want to join a band?" I said, and I, all I said was, "Are you professional?" And he said, "Yes." I said. Yeah. <laughs> so on the Monday morning, I just went off to, uh, to from Leicester to to uh, Northampton, where this group, the the Primitives, were playing, and we ended up doing a three year stint. We played in Birmingham mainly mm -hmm. at all the old uh, Silver Blades ice skating rinks and all the big pubs and the Elbow Room, all those places that are kind of you can kind of find out about them now on YouTube and yeah. stuff. You know, it was it was a there was a good music scene in those days because. Predominantly, entertainment was live entertainment. Yes. So, you know, it comes back to that thing of being in the right place at the right time. Mm. It was, there were heady days, you know, I'm not saying everything was fantastic, but there were opportunities. Yeah. And we ended up going to Italy for three years, which really helped me to 
flesh out my personality a little bit more, you know, yeah. became a pop band over there. But basically, outside of that experience, just living in a country where you learn a language, because I wanted to learn, so yeah. I can speak pretty good Italian now. I can't, I can't discuss politics and things. No, no. But I can, I can get around, I can ask him for directions, I can speak about the weather and, you know, tell people about what I've done, who I am, what yeah. I do, what I play, you know, quite easily. Because I, it was at that, again, at that time where I was just really like a sponge soaking up things. And mm. uh, I'm a big, you know, I'm a big Italian fan ever since, you yeah. know. A beautiful so place. that was that, and then I came back, and that's when I ended up at Rockfield. Mm. How did Basically, that come when I was, about? Well, when I was in Italy, I played. Uh, I played one of these. Uh, we played one of these uh, seaside resorts, mm -hmm. where on the Adriatic coast, in a place called Riccioni, which is near Rimini, mm -hmm. and uh, it was back to back with another group. And the other group were called Doc, the Doc Thomas Group. And we we got on really well with them, but they actually metamorphosed into Mot the Hoople. Oh right, okay. They went home because they were just out for a summer, a yeah. summer gig, and and we swapped phone numbers as as, as you could in those days. So there's any way of communicating with people. Um, didn't have mobile phones, so I don't know what number it was they gave me. <laughs> but somehow, when I got fed up with um, um, Italy, I came back to to London. And I had one of their numbers, and they were they were, they were no longer Doc Thomas. They were Mott the Hoople, and they were staying in a little uh, little seedy bed uh, basement flat in uh, just off Sloan Square. Mm -hmm. And do it, they were yeah, were doing quite well, not you know, quite nicely as Mott the Hoople. And uh, they let me stay there for a while, and I was going to auditions where there were just hundreds of drummers at these auditions, and basically you just you just couldn't get you couldn't get hired. And then they saw in the Melody Maker this advert for, a, record, uh, for a, a number, which I would never have picked up on. And it was the Rockfield Studios. Ah, right, okay. And they said, oh, we know him, because they're from Hereford. Right, yes. And it's, just, it's Hereford on Y, yep. Ross on Y, Monmouth, where yep. the studios just outside Monmouth. That's the, the River Y goes through Monmouth. So um, go down there. And of course, lo and behold, what would happen? But this, this band that the two brothers there were kind of, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you, you could really say they were managing them. It was almost like mentoring them and yeah. giving them, you know, giving them somewhere to stay. And uh, the studio was very embryonic in that time. Anyway, that group, lo and behold, they were from Leicester. Right, okay. So that was it. I was hired. Yeah. You know, and uh, we ended up making one album with, with the uh, esteemed late Gus Dudgeon as producer. He, he produced some of Elton John's early yeah. stuff and uh, Vid Stanshaw's Bonzo Dog Doobop. Yeah. He's, you know, he's, he's got a, he, he had a really good reputation. I'm yes. not quite sure. I think he was introduced to us via the two brothers at the studios. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that was that. Was that. And uh, I think basically what I did was I played with a few people after this group was called Spring. Uh, we, we we did about two two or three years and then it was it was kind of over you know there were various personnel changes and the record company dropped us uh, i know a funny a funny story about it actually is that because uh, this, this is all vinyl yeah. yes yeah um basically when i was in dar straits and we were doing our first tour of america um it was just clubs really nice little clubs uh, like big bars, I would say, really. Mm -hmm. um, somebody came in with a, this spring album that I'd, <laughs> I'd made, you know. And uh, of course, Mark was, thought it was one of his albums. You know, and, so, 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 so. and this guy said, oh no, I don't want you to sign it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, uh, it was brilliant. <laughs> oh, lovely. Oh, lovely. And you milked it for a while, I'm sure. <laughs> no, I know. I just didn't think of anything at the time. But, uh, Move over here, I want to plug you in. Oh, I've got to be plugged in. Oh, right, Sorry. okay. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Low battery. Your face maker's gone. <laughs> can you see me? I can see you. So that, that was um, that was spring. And then, the, 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 of course, the, in that two-year period, you've still got me? Yep, fine. So in that kind of period, the 
the studio had developed a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And when Spring, at the demise of Spring, Kingsley, who was the kind of ideas man and Charles was the pragmatic man, yeah. the two, Charles, the Ward brothers, um, he decided that he was going to have a house band. Um, yeah. And he invited myself and the guitarist from Spring to, to kind of be involved in that. Unfortunately for me, that was the extent of his kind of finance. He, there was no bass player or anything. Yeah. But it gave me a chance for the first time to rent a nice a, a cottage and be in one place at uh, one time instead of, you know, in the back of a van. Yeah. So that was good for me for about a year. And then I, I kind of tired of it because there, there wasn't much gainful employment. You know, mm. I think that's probably when I played with uh, or did sessions they weren't even sessions. It was so informal because you were there. You say, hey, you play tambourine. No, you can play this and that. You know, you just ended up doing it. And there was no formal agreement. It was yeah. just that yeah. I was guaranteed a retainer. Yeah. And it suited me. You know, but I played with a member. There was a big metal band, a rock band called Fog Hat. And yes. uh, it was probably when I played with Bruce Droop. And uh, I remember Dave D producing something. Um, and I played with a group called Prelude, and I did got invited via the the Gus Judgeon connection to make an album with Mike Chapman. Mm -hmm. You know the uh, the kind of acoustic guitar wizard. He's yeah. still around. Um, called Re the album's called Wrecked Again. Uh, Prelude, who I mentioned, there's quite quite a few. That, um, there's probably some I choose to forget. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> or is it me getting it all so? Uh, that was it. And then one of the guys was, um, that I worked with was Andy Fairweather Low. Yeah. Brilliant. Ended up doing some demos for him at the studio because he's a Welsh lad. And uh, that developed into being in his band to promote the album that ensued from those demos, which he'd cut in America. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't on that. Right. And we did some promo for that. And that kind of inspired me to to hand in my notice at, uh, at Rockfield. Cause I, I, I just think I was stagnating or it, it wasn't, it wasn't productive enough yeah. really for yeah. me, you know, but I had enjoyed the opportunity to, to do some serious woodshedding and play in the studio with a kit that was there when it, when there wasn't any, when the time wasn't booked by anybody. Mm. And then, so that was good. So we did all these, this promo and, and I said, so I'll, I thought, oh, I'll join his band, but it didn't last very long because his management didn't want the band that he created. So myself, uh, a guy called John David, um, the bass player who was, who was formerly in Love Sculpture with Dave Edmonds' band. Mm -hmm. um, we were kind of just cast aside. So there I was without any, regular employment and I found myself going up to um to London basically and uh I, I got involved with uh, a lot of kind of folks not I wouldn't really call it rock really folk music ended yeah. up playing with Bert Yansh for a while right okay which was really good for me because I met this guy called Rod Clements who was bass player and I liked I made a, I made an album with him called uh, A Rare Conundrum, Bert Jansch, and it's, uh, I still, uh, sometimes, I, you can get it on YouTube, uh, see some of it on YouTube, where those people who tend to remix it, and mm. they mix the guitar because they think Bert is this kind of, you know, standalone guitar player, but he actually enjoyed playing with a band. Yes, yeah. So it's a good album, um, even if I say so myself. Um, and uh, I even got my dog barking on one of the tracks. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and there was this sweet story. I mean, she actually gets a, a credit on the, on the, on the album. It's called Mantha, her name was a red setter. It says bar, uh, backing vocals. But I had said, can you just put barking vocals? Please? <laughs> and obviously somebody in the, the record company thought it was a typo. <laughs> I've corrected it. <laughs> I've corrected it to backing uh, vocals. Uh, so it doesn't really pan out, but you can hear the dog barking. And she's a one-take genius, so <laughs> that was great. Uh, I just had this tennis ball 
and then it's just it was just I don't know why it's just a very social kind of uh, atmosphere in Bert's Bert's band. I think he was desperate not to be on his own for a while. Yeah. yeah. So they had this little uh, three four piece outfit, um, and uh, I said I think the dog would be would be good on this track in the barking and they said yeah okay so oh, gee, well i've got myself into it open to ideas uh, they used to take dog everywhere and said so the engineer's sort of going along with it looking rather sort of skeptical and he said uh, can i have some level please <laughs> <laughs> so i had, had this tennis ball the dog chase and i would make to bounce it and and she would go down on on her haunches and and she would just eventually erupt into bar at a barking um fit you know and then we ran the tape and it just, it's even syncopated, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, that's, that's my dog, that is. Apple's so you Apple. should check that out. It's on something called, it's on the album called um, Rare Conundrum. And I think the track is uh, Three Chord Trick. Gonna have to check. But there's that. other stuff as well, you know. Um, I played Tabla on one of the songs. All I mean, right. very, very crudely. Yeah. But, um, and Spoons on another one. It was it was really good. It was really good, and I played. Ended up playing with uh, recording some stuff with Ralph McTell. Oh right. Post, post streets of London. Mm -hmm. I think I play on a, play on some stuff there on an album called Right Side Up, and then I. And it's like a snowball. Then I ended up playing with a group called Magna Carta. So I moved around, and it kind of suited me because um, you know I'd playing the same thing all the time. Sometimes it becomes a bit like a treadmill. Yeah, you know, it just becomes an automatic response to you know, and your kind of antenna get dulled. Yeah, you lose so, creativity a little bit. Yeah, well, you just play with the same people all the yeah. time, and it's yeah. like it, it's almost like wearing the same suit of clothes all the time. They they might fit well because you all have an understanding, but you do it. It becomes almost like these football teams that aren't very creative, you mm. know, mm. Uh, Watford, <laughs> <laughs> you know, or uh, very good at set pieces. Yeah. You do this and I'll do that. And then when you go that, I'll do this. And, you know, and, and in the end you find, you find the whole thing is like a, a straight jacket really, yeah. you know, you, you, and then you have this weird experience halfway through a tour and you've done about four weeks, and know, four weeks ago, you have this out of body experience where, Oh, I didn't even know I was playing in that bit. Oh, you know, you, you you just sort of you you, you kind of rise above it. Yeah. You're just watching yourself yeah. do it, and you end up at uh, the sound check the next day, and uh, the lighting guy jumps on you. And says, oh, I put this special spot on you because last night you twiddled your stick in, and I want to highlight it. That when did you do it in that song? I said, Well, I don't know. I just in a good mood last night. <laughs> I said, well, you've got to do it because I've got a spot and I need to know when it is. And so all these little tricks become part of the show until it's all choreographed. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's just, you know, I don't know, it just becomes very, not uncomfortable, but it, 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 it's... The Americans are good at it. Yes. The Americans yeah. are very good at it. Yeah. I play with a guy called Dennis LaCorie, post... Oh, Dr. Hook. Oh, yeah, post, yeah, yeah, post wire crates, and he, I, I did, I, I did about three or four tours with him, but it was over a three year period. But I wasn't playing with him permanently through the three years. It was just mm -hmm. little kind of concentrated sections of time playing mm -hmm. with him. Great, and, voice. Uh, he a fantastic voice and a really good rhythm guitar player on his night, mm -hmm. but he played instinctively. Yeah. And uh, not kind of, I wouldn't say he'd done a lot of woodshedding, but he had a natural feel for yeah. it. And on his night, there was a kind of visceral quality about his playing, which mm. was, uh, could be quite kind of exciting. Um, but he used to say stuff exactly the same every night, but the people believed him. Yeah. You know, I, and I don't, I could never fathom whether that was, um, just the the exotic nature of having a different accent, like an American accent, or because it's it it comes back to that thing. Like Jimi Hendrix was a sensation when he came out, um, and uh, 
on that Are You Experienced album, he did a thing called Fire. Yeah, another song, yeah. Bang, 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 and you know, Mitchell's playing his ass off. Yeah. And then it, it, there's, there's these power chords, which introduce the solo, and he goes, move over, Rover, let Jimmy take over. And, and you never question it. It's just cool, but, isn't it? <laughs> but, you know, anybody else, you think, you stupid little sod. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what, what, what really kind of governs that element of it. Is, is it the accent? Is it the fact that, you know, because they're not, they're not like you, they're more exotic? Mm. And, and that is a very, goes back to the Germany thing, you know. Absolutely. We were, we used to meet German groups and they were just all over us because they wanted to, buy, they wanted to learn by osmosis. Mm. How do you do? Th- how do you do this? And uh, you know the chord in uh, in uh, Apache. What chord is that? Is that a O seven? You know, and they just natural desire to to learn. Yeah. You know, mm. because the I think if you if you go on YouTube, somebody like Abba, you know, who are huge, yeah, yes, one of the guys. One of the guys, I forget which one it is, played in a Swedish pop group called the Hep Stars. Okay. H-E-P, Hep Stars. And you, that is, gives you the essence of European pop mm-hmm. of the time and, and how this Americanized pop music that we were, you know, kind of regurgitating in a way was so kind of infectious for for everybody, even the musicians. Yeah. It's 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 it is, you know, it's uh, goes back to that thing, Kathy's clown, Little Richard, Earl Palmer, all that stuff. There's there's a there's a visceral quality about it. And uh, it's about a, a band playing for each other. And I'm I'm afraid I think it, it's it's beginning to, beginning to lose that in this this modern day and age. Yeah. Okay. Everything's starting to, it's, it's, there's still good musicians, musicians around, but there's less opportunity and the process of recording seems to me to be somewhat more sterile. Mm. And, uh, you know, if you, if you, if you look back to that period and musician, musicians of that kind of generation, yeah, there would be times when they want to repair mistakes or not have mistakes on the record, but as you kind of get older and reflect upon it, you, you don't want to forfeit repairing a mistake for ruining a kind of feel that was generated yeah. at that moment in time. Absolutely. And that's very difficult to convey to people um, what the subtle difference is. Mm, yeah. Because now it's all kind of predicated upon being in tune, yeah. as in the auto auto. Yeah. All that horrible compressing sound, and the fact that they don't tolerate uh, any glissando anymore because the machine just Correct. jumps on it. Yeah, it, 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 it's you know, um, I, I do think it's sad. You know, it's. Uh, I wish that there was more kind of flexibility about it, but it just see it seems to be coming back to that same thing all the time that the people who go on these talent shows, you, you, the, the band is there for them. Yeah. All they do is sing. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's all stage managed to, to, to show them in the best light, but it's, it's not music as I understand it. No, no, totally agree. It's entertainment. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, you, I've got exactly the same feeling about that. 100% agree with you. And it's a shame, it's a shame. Yeah, but the the other thing is, that I'm, you're just in danger of uh, sounding like a you know boring old fart. It's it's just uh, I am open to kind of new ideas, but the the sound quality to me is it just kind of it leaves me wanting. You know, mm. I can't listen to stuff. I always recommend stuff if I've got stuff I, I like on YouTube and I recommend to people. I said, please either play it through a speaker. Play it through headphones or don't play it at all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't, re- a, a, a laptop doesn't reproduce music very well, does it? Or a phone or whatever. But you can get away with a pair of headphones. Oh, yeah, totally. In yeah. the laptop, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. that's pretty good. 
but um, no, people are just sort of in the habit of just consuming it from this little device. Mm. And uh, it, it may kind of be a catch-all device, but it doesn't, it doesn't catch everything. No, no way. No, exactly. No. So where are we, Matt? Um, I don't know. We've, we've, uh, we've, we've been, been to Germany. Yeah, I've told you right. about the Hep Stars. Yes. About, about Bert Jansch and uh, my, one of my dogs, one barking of the barking resources. vocals. Yeah. Um, I've, uh, I've done the folk bit. <laughs> I've done the studio bit. Yeah. And then I was in London. So, you know, that was it really. Um, basically, when I was uh, living in London, I firstly stayed with the Rod, the, the, the bass player I played with. Um, how did I met Rod? He was, he was in Lindisfarne, basically. Okay, yeah. But I played with him, with a, another folk, folkish guy called Rab Noakes. He was, was a Scottish singer-songwriter, very under the radar a lot, but uh, that was at that same kind of time. Mm -hmm. And I looked him up in London after the Mot the Hoople, after the, um, after the Andy Fair other thing. And uh, one of his cohorts in Lindisfarne, Psycow, rented me a room up in North London. Okay. And uh, because they're Geordies, Lindisfarne. Yes, yeah. Lo and behold, Mark came down around one, one day to, to see if he could borrow Simon's, uh, he's dead now, Psycow, um, borrow his Rebox. Okay. And I was in. So I ended up doing some percussion on it with shakers mm -hmm. and bongos, whatever was to hand, you know. Mm. And that was the end of that, really. It was what, what I was used to doing from Rockfield, just adding little, you know, what would I call it? Punctuation and, uh, you know, drawing up paragraphs, whatever yeah. you think drums, drums to do in that kind of context on yes. the recording. It's all about space, basically, for me. Um, and almost creating it by putting stuff on that doesn't really take up a lot of room, but yeah. adds something rather than just being there for the sake of it. Yes. Well, he, he came back about six months later looking for me. And that's how I was introduced into, into Dire Straits. So you were one of the founding members then? Yes. Yeah. Well, it was Mark, his brother, John, and uh, obviously Mark had kind of used John and David to, uh, put some flesh on his ideas and then suddenly want the drum and he came looking for me having worked with me. So yeah. uh, having done that almost kind of casual afternoons work at, at Cy Cow's house in North London. Mm. And so we started, uh, we started playing, you know, started practicing in uh, Deptford, dark, deep Deptford um, in a David and John's little, little flat. It's so on a like a tenement flat. Um, we ended up doing some gigs, and basically, John ha had a, a share in a, a record store called Honky Tonk Records, okay. which took its took its name from uh, Charlie, uh, a DJ, and and rock what they call he's described as a rock and roll chronicler, Charlie Gillette. Or right. Gillette, I don't know. I think he calls himself Gillette because he doesn't want to be associated with the razor. But he died. <laughs> He's dead now. And uh, he had a radio show on, on uh, the old LB uh, London radio. Uh, on, and, it was, and it was called Honky Tonk Radio or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and they, John knew him, not, not really intimately, but uh, he said, look, I've got this, got this record shop called Honky Tonk Records. If you, if you give me a little um, inkling of what you're going to play, I'll, I'll, I'll endeavour to stock those those records, and it was you know he played good stuff. Yes, played R and B as, as R and B as I know it, you yeah. know, not this modern R and B, <laughs> yeah. Bobby Womack, and you know, the the real McCoy stuff. Yes. Always had good rhythm sections, always had good vocals, good sound. You know, songs might have not been the best ever, but there was something about the. The, the atmosphere they created, it was kind of infectious, you yeah. know? So John, we went around, to, we, we made a demo tape and John said, I'm gonna play this to Charlie. Well, Charlie was kind of cute. We went around to his house. He said, well, I never, I never listen to tapes 
in the company of uh, the artists. So, well, I will listen to it and I'll let you know what I think, you know. And we were dispensed with, which is, I think it's really cute. And then, of course, uh, we thought, well, that'll be the end of that, really. But um, basically, that, f that coming weekend, we, uh, we went away somewhere to do a gig. And the people, David and John, really knew more, into, more on a more regular basis than me in the same tenement building estate, they descended on us on a Sunday night when we came back. You were on the radio. Oh, what? Wow. So what had happened basically was that Charlie had played this tape while he was finalizing his playing times mm. for his forthcoming Sunday show. It had to all add up to 90 minutes with the adverts and stuff. I think it was an advertising station. Can't remember. Um, and he decided that he wanted to play songs because he was so take, uh, taken with it. Yeah. So he, he spent the whole afternoon re-jigging re his timings to accommodate it because it was about five minutes and 40 seconds yeah, long. Wasn't it? Um, and uh, so that was it. And then we were up and running. And then it created like this snowball effect of all, you know, lawyers, A&R men, and they all contacted Charlie and he somehow contacted us. And then uh, we were put in touch with the, uh, an agent who became a manager, Ed Bicknell, bless him. And uh, off we went, you know. But the funny story about that is that prior to taking this tape to Charlie, we played it to these same people that heard us on the radio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in on a proper revox. Yeah. So we, the, the best we could have it reproduced. And they were quite sort of, you know, oh, that's quite nice, isn't it? Yes, very good, isn't it? And then they hear the same tape on the radio through a tinny transistor radio <laughs> and they're all over it you know oh it's fantastic you know and so you know i'm glad i remember things like that because it keeps you grounded yes absolutely you know you don't get carried away with with it when it's you know when it's you get bad reviews you don't get carried away when you get good reviews you know yeah. or over the top reviews it's you know it's uh, you can be flavor of the month and next month you can be just a, you know yesterday's yesterday's story so, yeah. so it's good like that tell me were you, was it dire straits from the very beginning was it named? no we were called cafe racers right okay we did one gig as the cafe racers maybe even a couple more yeah we played in places like the um islington mm -hmm. and not not the anchor and hope not the hope and anchor but somewhere else i remember some some pubs up there i mean there was a big there was a big pub scene in those days you know Is it the angel there then yeah yeah that's where i played that's where we played mm. the angel and uh i think we played as cafe racers because uh but uh somehow it got that got knocked on the head and we became dire straits um a friend of mine had said i've got a great name for a band dire straits and he was he was spell, uh, spelling it a g h t s Oh, right, okay. straights, yeah. with a kind of reference kind of i think really what he was hinting at was a kind of drug reference yeah yeah you know dope here like smokers smokers <laughs> dire straights you know like crap cigarettes or something. i don't know uh and that was what i put forward and then that got kind of changed to the phrase to be mm. in dire straits yeah, you yeah. know well i think it was i was a smart move so um yeah that's how the name came about and we were off and running and uh, it was it was great. It was really good. So I mean, that first album. Had you done <clears throat> a lot of the songs? Were they ready to go on that first album? Was yeah, it quite straightforward. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they were ready. To, we, we, they were kind of played in quite a lot. And not, I wouldn't say extensively, but um, it did know the songs when you went in. Yeah, probably a couple that weren't that were kind of written on the off the hoof because. Mm because of the playing time in those days uh, i think 20 minutes aside was the optimum yeah kind of time for a good bass reproduction you know the bass sound so yeah, of course and we played we did it in uh basin basin street studios with um steve winwood's brother muff oh muff yeah 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 it was really it was really it's really good fun it was really good fun, it was really, it was really good fun. um yeah i i it's so funny, you know. The, there were kind of different stratas going on in Dire Straits, you know. 
it was me, the kind of uh, experienced one. It was Mark, the woodshedding one. Yeah, yeah. And then there was David and John who were really, you know, trying to keep up, I think, <laughs> you know. So, um, yeah, I always likened John to a St. Bernard, you know, a bird dog, really, you know, faithful, loyal, dependable. Don't let him off the lead. No barrel of whiskey. <laughs> Don't let him off the lead. Oh, really? Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no improvisation, John. Yeah, yeah. You just do what we we agreed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's not a bad thing sometimes, is it? Oh, and then it just—I mean, that, it's a great album, and it, it we, is a great album. It took me a while to really be to, to to listen to it with a kind of non-critical eye. It is, it is, it is really. It does capture a lot of kind of stuff, and of course, it, it, it always falls into that category where you have a songwriter who's gleaning his songs from all of his life up to then. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But your first novel, mm. it's, 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 you know, you pick the creme de la creme, all the stuff that works out best. Yeah. And then six months later, you've got to do it all again. And, and you know, the actual drawing board is empty. Yeah, absolutely. There yeah. was a lot of pressure for him. No, but, yeah, uh, that's a good, yeah, good way of putting it. I mean, it's... Uh, you know, if, you, if you look at it, you know, this, I like some of the stuff on the second album, but it wasn't as successful. Um, you've got Once Upon on the West, which I really like. That's like similar to In the Gallery. Mm. You've got Lady Writer, which is similar to um, Sultans of Swing. Mm. You, you know, they, they, that's going to happen, isn't it? You know, you've got your. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not kind of cr critiquing. I'm just saying that's what happens. It's yeah. it's really hard. The second album is hard purely because of that thing where you just you do take all the best best material from your first album yeah. and by that's very nature you've discarded everything else yeah and so if you go and pick it up it's kind of the dregs yeah. to, to put on yeah. the next album you've got to start again mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's uh, you know it is pressurized it is pressurized i have to ask and, right sultans of swing while we're there yeah yes i mean i've i've I played that song a lot with different bands over the. I mean, yeah. 70, 78 or seventy seven, the album came out. I can't remember. Uh, seventy eight, I think. Yeah, and I remember hearing "Songs of Swing." I mean, it instantly grabs guitarists, doesn't it? But yeah, it was, it was, it's the drumming that I, I. I love the lyrics and I love the drumming. And there's one oh, little bit, you know, the time bell ring, the little paradiddle between the ride. It's not a paradiddle. It's not a paradiddle. Is it not? Right? Everybody says paradiddle. It is not a paradiddle. Is it not? Well, you're surprised. It's not. Yeah, and, uh, I, it sounds I, I, like it, doesn't it? No, no, it doesn't no. sound like it. I, I, know, I knew what I played. Well, yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah I'm glad about it. Um, but it's, uh, I tell you, and I've, I said it once, and I got this really nice um, communication from this girl who was the, the daughter of uh -huh. the drummer, George Grantham, who played in Poco. Right, okay. Yeah, I'd, 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 I know he wasn't well at the time, but I don't know what the, the chrono chronologic order of it is, but mm. I had, I've, I've said this thing before. I got it off George Grantham, who, mm. who, who did this lick on a cowbell with the snare drum. Right. And instead of being the bell, it was the cowbell, and you can hear it quite clearly there. It's not a paradiddle. And I just took ages to learn how he did that. And uh, I just took it and put it on that, mm. the time bell thing. But it's, it's definitely not a paradiddle. Ah, I played it's it not wrong. A band it. It's, uh, no, it's definitely not. It's de definitely not a paradiddle. Ah. But it has been said before, you're not the first. Good. And you're not the first drummer. And you're not the first teacher to say. So, so you know, so there must, you, must be, you must be something. You, it's all about perception, but it, it, it isn't that at all. Ah. It's very close, but mm. it's not a paradigm. Ah, there we go. But it doesn't it work though? Hear the time bell ring, and you—that's just. I'm not trying to blow. Oh yeah, well that's that's what I've that's what I've always tried to do. You know, to try to be. It comes back to that thing we were talking about before about Kathy's clown. Mm. Dad, in the in the in the chorus, I don't know whether it's the chorus or it's not the chorus, is it? I don't know with them. Just, they have A and B bits. Yeah, and could yeah. either be A could be the chorus. And B, the verse, and vice versa, and different people. But uh, if you hear Kathy's Clown, there's a big bell thing on there. Mm. I, I want to be involved in the dialogue. Yeah. I don't want to be, this song's great. 
this song adds to the story, doesn't it? It's brilliant. Well, you like to think so, but you have to fight for it. I'm telling you. Really? Yeah, yeah because uh, I think a lot of guitar players, uh, as good as they are, they 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 see drums as some sort of you know room service thing. You know, mm. I, I, you, you shouldn't be in the way and stuff and. Uh, what was I going to say then? Something that helps to illustrate it much more clearly. I'll think of it in a minute. But mm. um, yeah, I, I, I do like to be involved. I'm, I'm not trying to force my conversation on other people because then that's kind of false. It's just, yeah. just. But I have been fortunate because when I recorded in Italy, I was still very young, 18, 19. And it was the first, not the first time, but the, the first time I'd be in the studio to make an album. Mm. but you're there for an extended amount of time yeah and uh so you you rather than being under the constraint of time you've got two or three weeks to do something and it it, it, it you can kind of sort of find a mode of working really mm. you can do a song on day one and then after about day five you think oh that doesn't sound so good anymore because we've set a higher standard in the interim you know they're playing on Track two is much better, so let's do side one. Let's do track one again. But I remember distinctly think when we did some record, I thought I've got this lick, you know, that I've just learned. I'm going to put in this song, and I'm really thrilled. And when I came back to listen to it, it just sounded like completely um, obtrusive, mm. you know, and just extracurricular. And I was deflated, you know. But uh, it's all about the process of learning, you know, really. You know, at least you've got the sense to actually think that and, and, and own up. Well, and yeah, I think right. in the early days, you just work on instinct. You know, you just say, well, that don't work. And they obviously know it doesn't work because they're going, oh, I don't like that. Mm. Mm. <laughs> but, you know. Um, but there's some interesting stuff because one of the, I can't remember the track name. Uh, it's gone, but it all, it's almost kind of starts with kind of a rumba kind of feel. Oh, you mean Water of Love? Yes, yes, that's the one. On, yeah. on, the, on, the, on the rim, isn't it? And it's just... It's, it's, it's not. It's, it's it's half on the rim. It's um, timpani beaters. Right. Okay. But but with a kind of quite a thick stem. Mm, mm. And one of the sticks you lay across as if you're doing a bossa nova yeah. block. Yeah. And the other one you play half on the drum at the edge. Yeah. And hitting the the bossa nova stick. Right. Okay. And it's and then you've just got the the two tom toms and the bass because I did that whole album with the. One floor, one rack, mm. and it was the 18 inch bass drum. Right, okay. From a Gretsch kit. Really? 12 inch, uh, 12 by 8 and 14 by 14. Brilliant. I've still got them. Yeah, lovely. But uh, the only thing I, I just detest about them is the hardware is sad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it just, yeah. just the, the tom tom legs always collapse. Yeah, and the consulate holder's never any good. Uh, <laughs> and I just don't, I don't know what to do because it's, I don't want to really change it now. No. So it's part of my practice kit, yeah. really. I did for a while take it around laterally up here because I just, without a roadie, if I do any gigs, and I haven't been doing it, of course, mm -hmm. um, I just didn't, the heavy kits or the awkward kits to manhandle into, back into pubs and things, wherever you're playing, mm. just put my back out. Yeah, yeah. And I go to the chiropractor and get it straightened, and that's the gig money, and I thought, I'll just use this little kit. But I was always paranoid about it being stolen. Oh, yeah. I have had kits stolen before. And it's just a horrible, horrible feeling. Mm. I know where I, I had this uh, Ludwig kit. Uh, but in Italy, uh, I upgraded to a Ludwig kit. I think I went out there with a, a Premier or something. And I got my first Ludwig kit. And we were involved in a motorway smash accident mm. where the, the equipment went down went down the motorway motorway out the back of the van and we pulled it all together but the bass drum just splintered right and was unsalvageable so i um i saved most of the the lugs and whatever you call the the, the bits that go go onto the shell to receive the lug yeah but i didn't have a full complement anymore so this guy made me a new shell and we put whatever logs were left and it was, it was two less aside. Oh, some right. guy in, this guy in Highwick said, that's an interesting bass drum. It's, it's not got the usual amount of lugs on it. And I, I'd, 
you're a bit of a fuckhead case, aren't you? <laughs> and uh, it was uh, one of these uh, all day festivals at High Wycombe Hall with the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band and Bullet. And we played early. And, and I packed the kit up and left it to the, with, in charge of, with the roadie. And we went home in the car back to the Rockfield Studios. And it, it, I remember him having to wait all day, or he wanted to see the bands. That's what it was, really. <laughs> and when he, he came in in the morning, he said, oh, I've lost the bass drum. <laughs> and I think it's that guy. Yeah. Wherever yeah. he is. So if you're still out there, <laughs> <laughs> High Wycombe Town Hall, you know who you are. But Sickening then, you know, though, isn't it? People, oh. Well, I'm over it now. But the funniest thing about that was um, I replaced it with a horrible Boozy and Hawks bass drum. It, it, it might even be an Olympic. It, it, and it didn't have a case or anything. I had no money. And we used to walk into these gigs. And it's still in the days in the early 70s when bands used to look at your gear and go, oh, All right. they're, jo they're jokers, aren't they? Yeah. I used to love it, love it, because you used to sort of set up and start playing. You'd say, yeah, change your mind now, haven't you? And it was, it's, it's, it's awful, all that kind of I don't juvenile, juvenile one-upmanship. I don't think that's changed, you know. Oh, it's changed for me. I, don't, I just don't, <laughs> you know, I just, it doesn't worry me anymore, you know. I mm. just play what I feel is appropriate. The only thing that bugs me really playing now is that I just don't play like that anymore. Yeah. You know? I don't have the desire or the, the feeling to play. There's a great bit of footage on YouTube of Dar Straits um, playing Once Upon a Time of the West, in, and I think it's in live in Dortmund. Okay. We want these uh, radio, uh, rock palast things. It's a, it's a huge minefield of stuff in that. Really well filmed. And we do Once Upon a Time of the West. And I'm wearing this baby grow suit, and that's a. Uh, it's really good. I'm, you know, I'm very critical about what I do, you know, but uh, that's, that is really, really good. And I don't know if, um, I think I'd already sort of stopped trying to be the best drummer on the night. I just want to be the best drummer I can be. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to be the best, best, best drummer in the room or the best drummer at the, what's it called? The... Uh, the exhibition, you know. Mm. In fact, I did some stuff for Paiste Symbols once, N not a lot, two or three. And I, and, and I said, well, what, where's the format? And he said, well, um, you just basically there'll be two or three other drummers and uh, I want you to, you'll be announced, you come on, you just play and every one of you will play and then we'll have a break. Then I'll do my Paiste Symbol selling spiel and then there'll be some questions and answers. And, and well, who's going to answer this? Well, whoever feels, feels they want to answer the question that's posed, they can answer it. So, um, and Rat Scabies was on from The Damned. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I thought, oh, God, that's going to be great, isn't it? Because I was quite a snob. And uh, he was great. Oh, he's a brilliant character. He was great as a character. I loved what he did when he went out and did his, did his little drum piece. It, was, it wasn't technical, but it was real. It was visceral and he meant it. Yeah. And it was on a Tom Toms and it just really worked for me. But when we came to the questions and, and answers, you know, there was myself, Rat, Simon Kirk, there would be somebody else who I can't remember. So I don't know what that says about them or me really. <laughs> but um, somebody said, what do you find the hardest thing about practicing? And he just ripped the microphone off the stand. Oh, that's easy to answer. He said, so he's off, rat. He said, um, when I practice, I know the idea is to practice to get better. And so I practice something I can't do. But it sounds like shit. So I give up <laughs> and I play something. So I play something I can already play. <laughs> so when I practice, I don't get any better. <laughs> and it's just... That stayed with me forever, and it's just the most concise, succinct piece of advice <laughs> for a starting point yeah. to, 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 you know, set about trying to be not a better drummer, 
but the best drummer that you can be, you know, yeah. into you. And the other thing is that great thing that Ringo used to do, which nobody does anymore, the splash sim, you know, that that open the hi hats a little bit, yeah, and get this lovely slushy, yeah, sound. And then the great thing about that is you can stomp on the hi hat and just dry it up, and it's just such a great. Yeah. It's great. To me, that's like the, the Leslie going from speaker, yeah. Leslie organ speaker on the Hammond going from fast to slow. It's yeah. just a wonderful yeah. kind of feeling. Texture, it's isn't it? It's a texture almost. Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Ah, fabulous. So there we are. Um, if you want to do any more, probably do it another time. I don't know what Absol you want to do. Well, hey, do you know what? It's been an absolute pleasure, Pick. I, I, I could quite happily sit here for three, two, three hours and just... Yeah, but then you've got to condense it all down. It's so, tricky. Um, well, maybe we'll do a part two at some point if you're if you're.